Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for another podcast. It's time for fields from charges. I want to remind you about the electric force. First of all, if I have a charge capital Q and a charge little q, and I want to calculate the force that big Q exerts on little q, I multiply the product, take the product of the charges, divided by the distance between them squared, times the r hat vector that points from the source charge to the target or the test charge, little q. And uh, then I multiply by the Coulomb constant, and I get the force. Now, it's sometimes useful to separate out the idea of the field. So the notion is you start with the same idea, but now you divide by the test charge. You take the force divided by the test charge, and you get the electric field produced by the charge capital Q. There's uh, The notion is that there's something in space that's acting on the charge little q, and the something in space that's acting is the field produced by the first charge. So that's the idea. Let's review a little bit about wh what field patterns might look like. If you calculate the field from a positive charge, it points away everywhere. You can always imagine putting a little test charge down and asking which way does the force on that test charge point if it's a little positive test charge, and that'll give you an intuitive sense of which way the field points. If you have a negative point charge, of course, a test charge will be attracted to it, and so you would have an electric field pointing toward a negative charge. And a dipole field is, a, is two charges of opposite sign separated by some distance. And the field pattern produced by a dipole looks a little bit like that. Now, what I want to do now is to compute the field produced by a dipole on the axis. And in order to work that out, I wanted to get an approximation for an algebraic. So we'll take a little aside here and do an algebraic exercise to approximate 1 plus x to the m when x is small compared to 1. So if you graph 1 plus x to the m, you get a whole family of curves depending on the value of m. Here's a set of curves where m goes from negative 5 to plus 5. You can see they're kind of all over the place. But if you zoom into the origin, you'll notice that they all look like straight lines. So there's hope that we could write a simple approximation, a straight line equation for these guys. They all pass through 1, so we know the intercept is 1 for all of them. But what about the slope? And so what you do is you take the derivative of the function near x equals 0 and look at the slope of the function at that point, And you'll notice that uh, the slope is just equal to m. Okay, when x is equal to 0, the slope is equal to m. The intercept, as we noticed a minute ago, is always 1. And so if x is much, much less than 1, we get the very simple result that 1 plus x to the power m is simply 1 plus m times x. Very easy. How does that help us out? That helps us out because we're calculating the field of a dipole, and that's simply the sum of the field produced by the positive charge in the dipole and the field produced by the negative charge in the dipole. And those are easily calculated using the uh, same Coulomb's law we used a minute ago. The only difference between the two is that one of them has a negative charge, the um, farther one, and it also is a little bit farther than r, and the positive one is a little bit less far than r. So the positive one is at a distance r minus s over 2, the negative one is at a distance r plus s over 2. Remember, s is the separation between the two charges in the dipole. And so we simply have to add these two fields together. And that's the answer right there. Now, that's an exact answer for a dipole made up of two charges separated by a distance s. But it's not a very satisfying answer because it's so darn complicated. So the question is, can we simplify it? And to simplify it, what I want to do is try to make it look like that thing we just worked out the approximation for. If I factor out the r downstairs, then these r minus s over 2 and r plus s over 2 um, become 1 minus s over 2r and 1 plus s over 2r. And as long as r is much greater than s, then each of those is 1 plus x, where x is something much less than 1. So we can use that approximation. In fact, <coughs> let's do this. Let's rewrite 1 over 1 minus s over 2r squared as 1 minus s over 2r to the negative 2. And then we can think of the minus s over 2r. It's kind of like an x. So we get 1 plus x to the power negative 2. It's 1 plus x 
to the power m, where m is negative 2, and x is negative s over 2r. And if you work that out, putting in the approximation that 1 plus x to the m is approximately 1 plus m times x, you get the simple result that it's just 1 plus s over r. And similarly, you get the same answer for the other one, which is 1 minus s over r. Notice that when you had 1 minus s over 2r squared in the denominator, it becomes 1 plus s over r in the numerator, and 1 plus s over 2r squared in the denominator is 1 minus s over r when it makes its way to the numerator. And so we can put that back into this expression, and we see that the 1s cancel, and the s over r's get doubled because they come in with the same sign in the end, and so we get uh, 2s over r cubed. And then putting everything else back in, we get the final expression. You can do a similar calculation for the off-axis dipole field, and you get a similar result. The difference here is that now it goes like just q times s over r cubed, not 2qs over r cubed. The other difference is, while the uh, parallel field pointed in the same direction as the line going from the minus charge to the plus charge, the perpendicular field points in the opposite direction. So we end up with the result that E parallel is 2 times Qs over R cubed, and E perpendicular is minus Qs over R cubed. Now if you think of the dipole as the product of Q times S, we can simplify this even farther, or further, simplify even further with uh, by replacing uh, Q times S with just P. So if you tell me the dipole moment, I can calculate the field on the axis and off the axis using these two results. So another couple of points. Um, when you're off the axis, the field gets more complicated. Uh, you end up with fields that point in all kinds of wacky directions. Uh, it turns out the easiest way to understand this is using the idea of electric potential, which we'll get to soon, but uh, haven't got to it yet, so we'll hold off on that for now. Then I did throw a couple of group work problems at people during class today, and I just wanted to flash those on the screen in the podcast in case you missed those, and, uh, and that's all there is to it. So pretty quick, pretty easy. Thanks.